Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Welcome back, everyone. So glad to have you here on today's show, our wellness weight loss show of the week. We're going to be talking about how to control cravings and feel less hungry. We're going to talk about intermittent fasting. We're going to talk about all the topics that you need to succeed in your wellness goals, your body transformation goals, and your anti-aging goals because they can all actually be one and the same. You can get your very best body with your very best health and also not have all the detrimental effects of a lot of nutrition-based uh, programs that are set to give you great upfront results, but detrimental metabolic results in the long term. So one of the things I would like to just add as we're getting started is I do hope that you tuned into yesterday's show. If you didn't, it would be great for you to listen to that show after today's show. So today's show is at stephencabral.com forward slash 1986. Yesterday's show was stephencabral.com forward slash 1985. And you can find all podcasts at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts. Uh, yesterday's show and today's show, they can be listened to separately, but they really do go hand in hand. And here's why. We're going to be talking about a lot of tips today, five specifically, that are going to allow that are going to allow you to not snack between meals. And it's going to allow you to also not snack before bed, which is the most detrimental time that you could be snacking. Like the most detrimental time for your health, for your body transformation goals, and your anti-aging goals because it ties directly then into your blood sugar, right? And advanced glycation end products which causes aging, as well as that snacking before bed is going to decrease your REM sleep, your deep sleep, and your HRV. And I, yesterday, I talked about on the show how you can prove it to yourself. Really, really important. So let's dive into today's show. I'm giving you five tips today, and then I have a previous show on cravings that was way back in the day, about five years ago, uh, that was episode 376. All right. So we're going to link up some shows for you today. Stephencabral.com forward slash 1986 is where we'll link everything up. And of course, you can find all of these podcasts anytime you want on iTunes, on Apple, uh, Spotify, Google Play, like you name it. It's on that podcast player most likely. And if it's not, let us know and we'll pop it on that podcast player if you have a favorite one uh, and you're living in Iceland right now, which we have actually many listeners in Iceland. Uh, we'll make sure we get it on a, a podcast player that you enjoy over there. I don't know why I just singled out Iceland, but it's a place that's been on my mind because I want to actually go and visit all the different springs over there. Uh, but enough about Iceland and all of our friends over there. Let's get into the five tips today that are going to help you to control cravings and to feel less hungry. This is something that I've been using in my personal practice for almost 25 years now because I actually started my career in this fantastic industry actually as a certified nutritionist and certified personal trainer, strength and conditioning specialist. So this is something that we needed to do with and my team uh, under me for all of the different body transformation clients we worked with and athletes, et cetera, because again, we needed them to be right on point with their goals. And then as I expanded my practice, became a doctor of naturopathy, uh, opened up a functional medicine based wellness center, integrative health. Uh, then we started using this of course with wellness based because it's really difficult to be at your best in terms of wellness or anti-aging if you're not controlling your blood sugar and digestion as well. All right. So first tip is this, we, meaning you and I should not have our largest meal before bed. Please tune into yesterday's show. We talked all about that. I gave you many reasons why. I'm just going to give you a couple today. And then, of course, I would love you to tune in as to the full show as to why about 15 minutes yesterday. So here's the issue with eating right before bed. One of the biggest things is that it's going to decrease your sleep quality. You might say, oh, well, I fall asleep. Great. I don't disagree with you. Don't disagree. You might fall asleep. Great. And, and that's fantastic. The problem is you want to get 90 plus minutes of deep sleep, two plus hours of REM sleep, and you want a good, strong heart rate, heart rate variability. Those people that have alcohol with dinner or have dinner within two hours or so of going to bed actually, or have their largest meal of the day, actually tip, uh, typically dip 
on their REM or their deep sleep uh, and or their heart rate variability. The only way to know that is simply to do one week where you're finishing dinner three to four hours before bed, typically by 6 p.m. or so. Then you're going to track your sleep using something like an aura ring or your favorite device. And then you'll go back to a week of eating dinner, let's say at eight o'clock every single night, like whatever you used to. And just because it can't be one day, you need to look at a week's worth of data and you need to make sure that all the other variables are the same. So for example, if you only sleep six hours the week where you stop in eating, um, you know, four hours before bed, well, that's not the same variable, right? You need to get, you need to go to bed at the same time every night, let's say 10 o'clock at night to six in the morning, right? 11 to seven, whatever you like to do. So, and again, I have shows on when you should go to bed too. I, I do hope that you check those out, but let's just say you keep that the same. Um, you keep your workouts the same. You keep your work stress the same. Okay. Then just change your one variable, which is your dinner. All right. And that's the time of the day. You'll be able to find it out. So another reason too, a lot of people say, well, I don't eat that many carbs at bed. So it's not spiking blood sugar. Listen, I get it. You know, a lot of people, they might, if it's a carb heavy meal or alcohol at night, you can actually dip in a hypoglycemia during the night, which means you start to wake up in and out of sleep. You start to produce more cortisol because you're dropping blood sugar. So you're set, your body says, oh, we need more blood sugar because uh, actually you need that to survive. So your body produces glucocorticoids, which is cortisol, and then you start to break down liver glycogen or muscle, whatever it might be, wherever it's stored that you need access to it. If you've already gone through your liver glycogen, probably haven't, but if you have, it'll start tapping into uh, muscle. And we always think, well, we're just going to tap into body fat all night. That's not the way that it works, right? It'd be great if that's how it works. Uh, and I know a lot of people like to share that with you, but that's not how it works in reality. So how it works in reality, if you have a huge meal for dinner, and I didn't even talk about this yesterday, so that's why, if you can, please do tune into the show every single day because I give new tips every day and things build off of each other. You can't teach everything in 15 minutes uh, on one day. I wish, I mean, I wish that was the case. That would be fantastic. But you know, one thing I didn't mention is when you have your biggest meal of the day, it doesn't matter if it's mainly just fat and protein, like you're just on a carnivore diet, whatever it is, you're still spiking blood sugar. It's one of the greatest um, facts that nobody ever talks about. I want to say myths, but it's not a myth. It is a fact. So if you have like 60 grams of protein at that meal, let's say you have a big steak and there's lots of fat, there's lots of protein, and you're like, oh, it's low carb. I'm not worried about my blood sugar. Trust me, there's a different index. So there's the glycemic index, right? The glycemic index of foods measures basically a food eaten on an empty stomach. That's why things are often overblown with the glycemic index, because typically you're not eating rice by itself, right? You're having rice with maybe chicken or fish and some vegetables. So the rice isn't going to be as high glycemic as you think that it is, but that's a, that's a topic for another day. So there's another thing though, that's way overlooked. That's almost never talked about and not a lot of people study. And it's called the glycemic load of a meal, not the glycemic index, not the GI, but the GL the glycemic load. And it says that a massive caloric meal, like a one meal a day, can also spike blood sugar. And again, you never have to trust me. You don't have to believe me if you don't want. That's okay. I'm not asking for that. What I'm saying is let me present to you a new topic for you to explore. And you can use a $20 glucometer. You can go to stephencabral.com forward slash resources. There's a hundred other companies that I recommend. And you can find a glucometer. And you can just press Apple F if you're, um, or Command F on your computer, and then just write in glucometer, and you'll find it on that page. Now, the interesting thing is this. You test your blood sugar a half hour after the meal, an hour after that meal. It still might be 120, 130, right? And you ate no carbs. How is that possible? Well, the glycemic load of a meal, right? So take a look at that. Really, really important. Okay. So tip number one is this. If you don't want to have highs and lows of blood sugar, eat normal size meals. Ideally, your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. Now, the timing can be changed to based, based on the intermittent fast that you're doing. I typically recommend somewhere between 12 and 16 hours for most individuals. Most people that work with us are doing around 6 p.m. at night till about 8 in the morning. I'll explain that more on another show. Okay, so that is that. You don't want highs and lows in blood sugar because if you drink alcohol before bed or you have a big carb-only meal with not balanced with proteins and fats, you wake up very hungry, or you wake up during the middle of the night because your blood sugar dropped, right? That's going to cause what? Cravings. What's your, what do you crave typically? You're going to crave a lot of times more sweets or carbs or snacks because you didn't keep yourself satiated enough. And we'll go through that today. All right. Number two is this space out your meals. Okay. Really important. You need to eat enough at a meal to stay satiated. So digestion takes place anywhere from 30 minutes. If you're just eating fruit, to an hour or so if you're just eating starch, like a sweet potato. 
And then like three to four hours if you're eating proteins, some vegetables with a lot of good fiber, and some carbs, right? So that's going to take a while to break down all of those foods. And it can be even longer if you're eating like a raw salad and like steak, right? That's going to be in your stomach for a lot of people for, for many hours. And that's not a bad thing. It just means that digestion is going to take place over many hours. So it's really important that you don't put more food in until the food that you just ate is already out of your stomach. Again, not a lot of people teach this, but if you put new food on partially digested food, you're going to create bloating from gas, from fermentation of putting, think about this, you're cooking chicken soup in a big pot, right? You're boiling the water. Now that you keep it on low, things are really hot in there. And then it's almost ready. It's almost ready. It's got like a half hour to go. And then you drop in more raw chicken. You ruined everything right? Now it's going to take another three hours, four hours to cook all that, whatever might be on the heat. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is space out your meals, minimum of three to four hours. All right. We're, and again, I'm not going to get into the specifics today, but that's typically what we're always doing in our practice. Um, that allows also your blood sugar to reset because you don't want highs and lows all the time in blood sugar. You eat a meal, your blood sugar goes up mildly to moderately at maximum, right? Because we're eating fiber and we're eating protein in there. And then it comes back down really within about two hours, three hours maximum. So now if you're going five hours, let's say you, have, you finish, let's say you finish lunch at one and you're not having dinner until five, five thirty. Okay. Well, that's about what? Four hours, four and a half hours. Okay. So our blood sugar went down within an hour and a half, two hours. If we're eating a normal meal, like we talk about good. Now really you are tapping into body fat the rest of that time. That's a great thing, right? So allow your body to get used to going up and then down, not up and down, up and down, up and down the whole day, right? That's really, really important. There is, there's a time and place for snacking. Uh, there really is, but it's more for like athletes and people that are really needing to fuel their body all day long. Okay. Uh, number three is this, make sure you're eating 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein every single day. Okay. So I did a show on this. It was episode 1980. You're welcome to check that out. We'll try to link it up at 1986 uh, today, but it's like, how much protein do you need per day? A lot of people eat way too much protein. They really do. However, there's a big segment of the population doing one meal a day or two meals a day or plant-based only, or, and they're just not getting the 0.8 grams per kilogram. And again, like I know for we Americans, uh, working with kilograms is difficult, right? The 2.2 pounds, it's, it gets a little confusing. Easiest way to think about it is this. Divide your body weight in half in pounds, right? You weigh 160 pounds, okay. 80 pounds, right? I mean, so that, that's about 80, right? So we weigh 80 pounds. Now, it's not quite half your weight because we're talking about 0.8 in kilograms, okay? So what do we, and, and 160 is more like 72 kilos. So what do we need? Well, we need 0.8 of 72. Again, you don't need to do all the math. Just think about half your body weight and then less than that, right? So if you weigh 160 pounds, half your body weight is 80. Okay, a little less than that, about 70, right? And that's, that's close enough, right? It's close enough. So that's what you need typically per day. So you might say 70 grams of protein. That seems like a lot. Well, it's not that much. And if you're someone that works out and exercises, that's really the minimum that you need. You shouldn't go overboard. I've talked about that many times. It's super important that you don't go overboard uh, for various health-based reasons, but you do need a minimum and it's going to keep you satiated. So most people need about 20 grams to 25 grams per meal. Let's say you're a little larger body. Let's say that you're someone that lifts more weights. You might need more like 30 grams per meal three times a day. It's not an exorbitant amount. It's just the minimum, right? So 20 grams a meal is actually easier than you think. Um, honestly, it really is. You can use something like the daily nutritional support in the morning. It's 15 grams. You add a little bit more to it, you're getting to 20, right? Some nuts, some seeds, whatever you'd like. At lunch, you only need a palm size, not your whole hand, a palm size a uh, piece of salmon, or you can do a plant-based lunch. A lot of times that's what I do. Hemp hearts, three tablespoons. You're getting 15 grams right there. Yeah, a little sweet potato. Sweet potato has some protein. Your broccoli, a cup of broccoli has a couple grams of protein. You'll get to 20, no problem, right? Dinner, that palm-sized piece of chicken or fish or whatever you'd like to do, you know, you're getting over 20 grams right there. So it's not difficult, but you have to be cognizant of it. Why am I talking so much about protein? If you are hungry within an hour to an hour and a half of eating a meal, most likely you didn't get one of two things, fiber, enough fiber or enough protein. Make sure you're getting your 10 grams of fiber or so at a meal. Make sure you're getting at least 15 to 20 grams of protein minimum. All right. That's going to help a lot with cravings. Number four is this. 
respect your meal timing. I love this as well. So one of the ways that I was able to overcome my insomnia that I talked about on the Monday show this week is that I set up a sleep schedule and lo and behold, it worked. Took about three weeks, used my sleep-based supplements, had to get myself to bed earlier, all these different things, and it was painful for three weeks. Hey, but sometimes things are painful for the short amount of time to then be beneficial, right? I had to wake up at the same time every day. Even if I only got four hours of sleep that night, I had to wake up at the same time every day. Then what did I do? Well, I had to stay, go to bed the same time every night. Now, here's what happens. After three weeks, good, I reset it. I use my sleep supplements. I begin to wean off those. Life is fantastic. I can now train my body when to go to bed. So now I have to, now I want to stick with that, right? It's huge benefits to sleep. So what I say is now I need to stay within a half hour on either side of bedtime. I can go to bed at 9.30. I can go to bed at 10.30. My typical bedtime is 10 p.m. That's what I do. I wake up around 5.30. So uh, that is what we need to do for meal timing as well. Because then our body gets used to when it should go to bed. So now I can fall asleep within 10 minutes of my head hitting the pillow. As long as it's within the parameter of about 30 minutes. Body can deal with a little bit, not a lot of it. So <laughs> that's my new that's my new phrase. Uh, so you know, when we're looking at meals within half of the sa- half hour of the same time every day. So I could eat breakfast at 7:30, I could eat breakfast at 8:30. My breakfast is typically eight o'clock, right? It's my smoothie, my oatmeal, etc. And lunch, okay. Lunch is typically around 12.31. Well, what do I do? Well, I could eat lunch a half hour before, a half hour after. But then my body gets used to eating at those times, and believe it or not, it tells me when it's ready to eat. It starts to build up that hunger that says, good, we're hungry. We're ready then to take on food. So if you do that, that is going to allow your body to know when it's time to eat. If you're always eating and you're always grazing, your body has no idea when it's supposed to turn on digestion and turn off digestion. Super big tip right there. All right, number five is this. Incorporate, excuse me, incorporate intermittent fasting daily and then weekly. So, you know, it's interesting, but I consider like 12 hour overnight fast just normal human life, you know, for eating. But a lot of people consider that an intermittent fast. And it is, you know, technically it is. The only people that shouldn't be fasting for 12 hours a day are those people with hypoglycemic issues. Uh, Maybe they're dealing with blood sugar dysregularity. Uh, such as diabetes, uh, or they have adrenal-based issues, you know, HPA access issues. And again, I was, I was there for all of them. I had type 2 diabetes, I had Addison's disease, uh, and certainly hypoglycemia, uh, which led then to hyperglycemia, because I would drop so low in blood sugar that my body would overproduce glucocorticoids, and then I would have high blood sugar eventually. Couldn't do that anymore, and then I ended up with Addison's disease, which I'm happy to say, again, I truly believe you can overcome any uh, thing life throws your way health wise. And, um, I no longer have any of those issues. So that's, again, I learned from a lot of brilliant, um, clinicians and doctors and, uh, doctors overseas as well. And then that's just, now I try to pay it forward to you. So for most people though, at least eight, eight, eight o'clock at night to eight in the morning, ideally six o'clock at night to about an hour or two after you wake up right? That's great for most people. Most people stop eating at six, start waking, uh, start eating again at eight when you start the stress of the day. You can adjust it yourself and you're going to have to play with it a little bit, right? If you start to get a headache or moody or cranky or any of these things, uh, when you start to get moving in the morning, well, you need to eat just a few minutes before that. You got to give your body some fuel. There's nothing wrong with that. You can transform your body uh, with eating breakfast. A lot of people think that like somehow you can't eat breakfast anymore. You can, you just have to, you just the schedule things properly. Like I talked about on yesterday's show as well. So uh, now, don't get me wrong. For some people, like we have a body transformation system called the Fat Locity System, and it teaches you specific eating plans. And our plan on that for people that want to transform their bodies is typically 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we talk about what breakfast should be, what lunch should be, what dinner should be, how to work in um, some even fasted cardio if you want in the morning or just walking or whatever you'd like. Uh, but that's very specific. And again, for most people, a daily intermittent fast be- somewhere between 12 hours and 16 hours is going to be healthy and fantastic. And if you're still running your labs, like the big five, or at least the stress mood and metabolism, you can always be checking in on your cortisol levels, estrogen levels, uh, androgens like testosterone, as well as your thyroid. And if you're ever worried about your metabolism dipping uh, from a longer fast, you can always run the labs and the labs will tell you exactly what's going on. So, you know, that's really what it's about. And then as you get a little bit more advanced and you're used to doing your 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, then you can get into a one day a week fast uh, that I will link up that 
that, how to do that today at stephencabral.com forward slash 1986. That's my one day reset diet. It works phenomenally well because every day you're still having dinner, but I teach you how to reset that metabolism. I do it every Monday, uh, three out of four Mondays a month. And, uh, and certainly you can do the same as you become a little bit more advanced. So that is my time for today. Hopefully the show was helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in as always. And of course, if it was helpful, please do feel free to share this information with anyone else you believe it could serve. Take care. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Before you run, I want to make sure that you have gone over and visited our online functional medicine practice over at equa.life. And that is because this week we are offering up to 25% off during our semi-annual sale. It only happens twice a year, once every six months. And I want to make sure you do not miss it this July. We offer up to 25% off store-wide on your favorite at-home functional medicine lab tests, protocols, and of course, individual nutritional supplements. This will allow you to pick up that at-home lab test you've been looking to do for yourself or maybe for the whole family. Pick up the CBO protocol, the power support protocol, the heavy metal detox, a functional medicine detox, whatever it is that you need right now, it is up to 25% off store-wide. Something that we love to do for our community. You won't see this widely advertised, but it is for our podcast listeners and of course, our online community support group. So, take advantage of the savings. Let us know what you decided to invest in. And of course, we're here for you. If you have any questions, do feel free to reach out. Again, we are here to help. Head on over to equi.life for savings up to 25% plus daily deals that you won't want to miss. Take care, everyone.